Section 4 of A General Introduction to Psychoanalysis by Sigmund Freud Translated by Granville Stanley Hall This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ashley Jane Chapter 4 The Psychology of Errors Conclusion we may certainly put it down as the conclusion of our labours up to this point that errors have a meaning, and we may make this conclusion the basis of our further investigations. Let me stress the fact once more that we do not assert, and for our purposes need not assert, that every single mistake which occurs is meaningful, although I consider that probable. It will suffice us if we prove the presence of such a meaning with relative frequency in the various forms of errors. These various forms, by the way, behave differently in this respect. In the cases of tongue slips, pen slips, etc., the occurrences may take place on a purely physiological basis. In the group based on forgetfulness, forgetting names or projects, mislaying objects, etc., I cannot believe in such a basis. There does very probably exist a type of case in which the loss of objects should be recognised as unintentional. Of the mistakes which occur in daily life, only a certain portion can in any way be brought within our conception. You must keep this limitation in mind when we start henceforth from the assumption that mistakes are psychic acts and arise through the mutual interference of two intentions. Herein we have the first resort of psychoanalysis. Psychology hitherto knew nothing of the occurrence of such interferences and the possibility that they might have such manifestations as a consequence. We have widened the province of the world of psychic phenomena quite considerably and have brought into the province of psychology phenomena which formerly were not attributed to it. Let us tarry a moment longer over the assertion that errors are psychic acts. Does such an assertion contain more than the former declaration that they have a meaning? I do not believe so. On the contrary, it is rather more indefinite and open to greater misunderstanding. Everything which can be observed about the psychic life will on occasion be designated as a psychic phenomenon but it will depend on whether the specific psychic manifestations resulted directly from bodily, organic, material influences, in which case their investigation will not fall within the province of psychology, or whether it was more immediately the result of other psychic occurrences, back of which, somewhere, the series of organic influences then begins. We have the latter condition of affairs before us when we designate a phenomenon as a psychic manifestation, and for that reason it is more expedient to put our assertion in the form, the phenomena are meaningful, they have a meaning. By meaning we understand significance, purpose, tendency and position in a sequence of psychic relations. There are a number of other occurrences which are very closely related to errors, but which this particular name no longer fits. We call them accidental and symptomatic acts. They also have the appearance of being unmotivated, the appearance of unsignificance and unimportance, but in addition, and more plainly, of superfluity. They are differentiated from errors by the absence of another intention with which they collide and by which they are disturbed. On the other side they pass over without a definite boundary line into the gestures and movements which we count among expressions of the emotions. Among these accidental acts belong all those apparently playful, apparently purposeless performances in connection with our clothing, parts of our body, objects within reach, as well as the emission of such performances, and the melodies which we hum to ourselves. I venture the assertion that all these phenomena are meaningful and capable of interpretation in the same way as are the errors that they are small manifestations of other more important psychic processes valid psychic acts 
but I do not intend to linger over this new enlargement of the province of psychic phenomena, but rather to turn to the topic of errors, in the consideration of which the important psychoanalytic inquiries can be worked out with far greater clarity. The most interesting questions which we formulated while considering errors, and which we have not yet answered, are, I presume, the following. We have said that the errors are the result of the mutual interference of two different intentions, of which the one can be called the intention interfered with, and the other the interfering intention. The intentions interfered with give rise to no further questions, but concerning the others we want to know, firstly, what kind of intentions are these which arise as disturbers of others, and secondly, in what proportions are the interfering related to the interfered. Will you permit me again to take the slip of the tongue as representative of the whole species and allow me to answer the second question before the first? The interfering intention in the tongue slip may stand in a significant relation to the intention interfered with, and then the former contains a contradiction of the latter, correcting or supplementing it. Or, to take a less intelligible and more interesting case, the interfering intention has nothing to do with the intention interfered with. Proofs for the first of the two relations we can find without trouble in the examples which we already know and in others similar to those. In almost all cases, the tongue slips where one says the contrary of what he intended, where the interfering intention expresses the antithesis of the intention interfered with, the error is the presentation of the conflict between two irreconcilable strivings. I declare the meeting opened, but would rather have it closed, is the meaning of the President's slip. A political paper which has been accused of corruptibility defends itself in an article meant to reach a climax in the words, Our readers will testify that we have always interceded for the good of all in the most disinterested manner. But the editor who had been entrusted with the composition of the defence wrote in the most interested manner. That is, he thinks, to be sure I have to write this way, but I know better. A representative of the people who urges that the Kaiser should be told the truth, Ruckhalklos, hears an inner voice which is frightened by his boldness, and which through a slip changes the Ruckhalklos into Ruckgratlos. In the examples familiar to you, which have the impression of contraction and abbreviation, it is a question of a correction, an addition or continuation by which the second tendency manifests itself together with the first. Things were revealed, but better say it right out, they were filthy, therefore things were refiled. The people who understand this topic can be counted on the fingers of one hand. But no, there is really only one who understands it, therefore counted on one finger. Or, my husband may eat and drink whatever he wants, but you know very well that I don't permit him to want anything, therefore he may eat and drink whatever I want. In all these cases, therefore, the slip arises from the content of the intention itself, or is connected with it. The other type of relationship between the two interfering intentions seems strange. If the interfering intention has nothing to do with the content of the one interfered with, where then does it come from and how does it happen to make itself manifest as interference just at that point? The observation which alone can furnish an answer here recognises the fact that the interference originates in a thought process which has just previously occupied the person in question and which then has that after effect irrespective of whether it has already found expression in speech or not. It is therefore really to be designated as perseveration, but not necessarily as the perseveration of spoken words. Here also there is no lack of an associative connection between the interfering and the interfered with, yet it is not given in the content, but artificially restored, often by means of forced connecting links. 
Here is a simple example of this, which I myself observed. In our beautiful Dolomites, I meet two Viennese ladies who are gotten up as tourists. I accompany them a short distance, and we discuss the pleasures, but also the difficulties, of the tourist's mode of life. One lady admits this way of spending the day entails much discomfort. It is true, she says, that it is not at all pleasant when one has tramped all day in the sun, and waist and shirt are soaked through. At this point, in this sentence, she suddenly has to overcome a slight hesitancy. Then she continues, but then when one gets knack hosed and can change. We did not understand this slip, but I am sure you can easily understand it. The lady wanted to make the enumeration more complete and to say, waist, shirt and drawers. From motives of propriety, the mention of the drawers, hose, was suppressed. But in the next sentence of quite independent content, the unuttered word came to light as a distortion of the similar word house, house. Now we can turn at last to the long-delayed main question, namely, what kind of intentions are these which get themselves expressed in an unusual way as interferences of others, intentions within whose great variety we wish nevertheless to find what is common to them all? If we examine a series of them to this end, we will soon find that they divide themselves into three groups. In the first group belong the cases in which the interfering tendency is known to the speaker, and which, moreover, was felt by him before the slip. Thus, in the case of the slip refilled, the speaker not only admits that he agreed with the judgment filthy, on the incidents in question, but also that he had the intention, which he later abandoned, of giving it verbal expression. A second group is made up of those cases in which the interfering tendency is immediately recognised by the subject as his own, but in which he is ignorant of the fact that the interfering tendency was active in him just before the slip. He therefore accepts our interpretation, yet remains to a certain extent surprised by it. Examples of this situation can perhaps more easily be found among errors other than slips of the tongue. In the third group, the interpretation of the interfering intention is energetically denied by the speaker. He not only denies that the interfering tendency was active in him before the slip, but he wants to assert that it was at all times completely alien to him. Will you recall the example of Hiccough and the absolutely impolite disavowal which I received at the hands of this speaker by my disclosure of the interfering intention? You know that so far we have no unity in our conception of these cases. I pay no attention to the Toastmaster's disavowal and hold fast to my interpretation while you, I am sure, are yet under the influence of his repudiation and are considering whether one ought not to forego the interpretation of such slips and let them pass as purely physiological acts, incapable of further analysis. I can imagine what it is that frightens you off. My interpretation draws the conclusion that intentions of which he himself knows nothing may manifest themselves in a speaker and that I can deduce them from the circumstances. You hesitate before so novel a conclusion, and one so full of consequences. I understand that, and sympathise with you to that extent. But let us make one thing clear. If you want consistently to carry through the conception of errors which you have derived from so many examples, you must decide to accept the above conclusion, even though it be unpleasant. If you cannot do so, you must give up that understanding of errors which you have so recently won. Let us tarry a while over the point which unites the three groups, which is common to the three mechanisms of tongue slips. Fortunately, that is unmistakable. In the first two groups, the interfering tendency is recognised by the speaker. In the first, there is the additional fact that it showed itself immediately before the slip. In both cases, however, it was suppressed. The speaker had made up his mind not to convert the interfering tendency into speech, and then the slip of the tongue occurred. 
that is to say the suppressed tendency obtains expression against the speaker's will in that it changes the expression of the intention which he permits mixes itself with it or actually puts itself in its place this is then the mechanism of the tongue slip from my point of view i can also best harmonize the processes of the third group with the mechanism here described i need only assume that these three groups are differentiated by the different degrees of effectiveness attending the suppression of an intention in the first group the intention is present and makes itself perceptible before the utterance of the speaker not until then does it suffer the suppression for which it indemnifies itself in the slip in the second group the suppression extends farther the intention is no longer perceptible before the subject speaks it is remarkable that the interfering intention is in no way deterred by this from taking part in the causation of the slip through this fact however the explanation of the procedure in the third group is simplified for us i shall be so bold as to assume that in the error a tendency can manifest itself which has been suppressed for even a longer time perhaps a very long time which does not become perceptible and which therefore cannot be directly denied by the speaker but leave the problem of the third group from the observation of the other cases you most draw the conclusion that the suppression of the existing intention to say something is the indispensable condition of the occurrence of a slip we may now claim that we have made further progress in understanding errors we now not only know that they are psychic acts in which we can recognize meaning and purpose and that they arise through the mutual interference of two different intentions but in addition we know that one of these intentions must have undergone a certain suppression in order to be able to manifest itself through interference with the other the interfering intention must itself first be interfered with before it can become interfering naturally a complete explanation of the phenomena which we call errors is not attained by this we immediately see further questions arising and suspect in general that there will be more occasions for new questions as we progress further we might for example ask why the matter does not proceed much more simply if there is an existing purpose to suppress a certain tendency instead of giving it expression then this suppression should be so successful that nothing at all of the latter comes to light or it could even fail so that the suppressed tendency attains to full expression but errors are compromise formations they mean some success and some failure for each of the two purposes the endangered intention is neither completely suppressed nor does it without regard to individual cases come through wholly intact we can imagine that special conditions must be existent for the occurrence of such interference or compromise formations but then we cannot even conjecture what sort they may be nor do i believe that we can uncover these unknown circumstances through further penetration into the study of errors rather will it be necessary thoroughly to examine other obscure fields of psychic life only the analogies which we there encounter can give us the courage to draw those assumptions which are requisite to a more fundamental elucidation of errors and one thing more even working with small signs as we have constantly been in the habit of doing in this province brings its dangers with it there is a mental disease combined paranoia in which the utilization of such small signs is practiced without restriction and i naturally would not wish to give it as my opinion that these conclusions built up on this basis are correct throughout we can be protected from such dangers only by the broad basis of our observations by the repetition of similar impressions from the most varied fields of psychic life we will therefore leave the analysis of errors here but may i remind you of one thing more 
Keep in mind, as a prototype, the manner in which we have treated these phenomena. You can see from these examples what the purposes of our psychology are. We do not wish merely to describe the phenomena and to classify them, but to comprehend them as signs of a play of forces in the psychic, as expressions of tendencies striving to an end, tendencies which work together or against one another. We seek a dynamic conception of psychic phenomena. The perceived phenomena must, in our conception, give way to those strivings whose existence is only assumed. Hence we will not go deeper into the problem of errors. But we can still undertake an expedition through the length of this field in which we will re-encounter things familiar to us and will come upon the tracks of some that are new. In so doing we will keep to the division which we made in the beginning of our study of the three groups of tongue slips with the related forms of pen slips, misreadings, mishearings, forgetfulness with its subdivisions according to the forgotten object, proper names, foreign words, projects, impressions, and the other faults of mistaking, mislaying and losing objects. Errors, in so far as they come into our consideration, are grouped in part with forgetfulness, in part with mistakes. We have already spoken in such detail of tongue slips, and yet there are still several points to be added. Linked with tongue slips are smaller effective phenomena which are not entirely without interest. No one likes to make a slip of the tongue. Often one fails to hear his own slip though never that of another. Tongue slips are in a certain sense infectious. It is not at all easy to discuss tongue slips without falling into slips of the tongue oneself. The most trifling forms of tongue slips are just the ones which have no particular illumination to throw on the hidden psychic processes, but are nevertheless not difficult to penetrate in their motivation. If, for example, any one pronounces a long vowel as a short in consequence of an interference no matter how motivated he will for that reason soon after lengthen a short vowel and commit a new slip in compensation for the earlier one the same thing occurs when one has pronounced a double vowel unclearly and hastily for example an u or an oi as i the speaker tries to correct it by changing a subsequent I or U to OI. In this conduct, the determining factor seems to be a certain consideration for the hearer who is not to think that it is immaterial to the speaker how he treats his mother tongue. The second compensating distortion actually has the purpose of making the hearer conscious of the first and of assuring him that it also did not escape the speaker. The most frequent and most trifling cases of slips consist in the contractions and foresoundings which show themselves in inconspicuous parts of speech. One's tongue slips in a longer speech to such an extent that the last word of the intended speech is said too soon. That gives the impression of a certain impatience to be finished with the sentence and gives proof in general of a certain resistance to communicating this sentence or speech as a whole. Thus we come to borderline cases in which the differences between the psychoanalytic and the common physiological conception of tongue slips are blended. We assume that in these cases there is a tendency which interferes with the intention of the speech. But it can only announce that it is present and not what its own intention is. The interference which it occasions then follows some sound influences or associative relationship and may be considered as a distraction of attention from the intended speech. But neither this disturbance of attention nor the associative tendency which has been activated strikes the essence of the process. This hints, however, at the existence of an intention which interferes with the purpose speech, an intention whose nature cannot, as is possible in all the more pronounced cases of tongue slips, this time be guessed from its effects.
Slips of the pen, to which I now turn, are in agreement with those of the tongue, to the extent that we need expect to gain no new points of view from them. Perhaps we will be content with a small gleaning. Those very common little slips of the pen, contractions, anticipations of later words, particularly of the last words, again point to a general distaste for writing and to an impatience to be done. The pronounced effects of pen slips permit the nature and purpose of the interfering tendency to be recognised. One knows in general that if one finds a slip of the pen in the letter, everything was not as usual with the writer. What was the matter one cannot always establish. The pen slip is frequently as little noticed by the person who makes it as the tongue slip. The following observation is striking. There are some persons who have the habit of always re-reading a letter they have written before sending it. Others do not do so. But if the latter made an exception and re-read the letter, they always have the opportunity of finding and correcting a conspicuous pen slip. How can that be explained? This looks as if these persons knew that they had made a slip of the pen while writing the letter. Shall we really believe that such is the case? There is an interesting problem linked with the practical significance of the pen slip. You may recall the case of the murderer H, who made a practice of obtaining cultures of the most dangerous disease germs from scientific institutions by pretending to be a bacteriologist, and who used these cultures to get his close relatives out of the way in this most modern fashion. This man once complained to the authorities of such an institution about the ineffectiveness of the culture which had been sent to him, but committed a pen slip, and instead of the words, in my attempts on mice and guinea pigs, was plainly written, in my attempts on people. This slip even attracted the attention of the doctors at the institution, but so far as I know, they drew no conclusion from it. Now what do you think? Might not the doctors better have accepted this slip as a confession and instituted an investigation through which the murderer's handiwork would have been blocked in time? In this case was not ignorance of our conception of errors to blame for an omission of practical importance. Well, I am inclined to think that such a slip would surely seem very suspicious to me, but a fact of great importance stands in the way of its utilisation as a confession. The thing is not so simple. The pen slip is surely an indication, but by itself it would not have been sufficient to instigate an investigation. That the man is preoccupied with the thought of infecting human beings, the slip certainly does betray, but it does not make it possible to decide whether his thought has the value of a clear plan of injury or merely of a fantasy having no practical consequence. It is even possible that the person who made such a slip will deny this fantasy with the best subjective justification and will reject it as something entirely alien to him. Later, when we give our attention to the difference between psychic and material reality, you will understand these possibilities even better. Yet this is again a case in which an error later attained unsuspected significance. In misreading, we encounter a psychic situation which is clearly differentiated from that of the tongue slips or pen slips. The one of the two rival tendencies is here replaced by a sensory stimulus and perhaps for that reason is less resistant. What one is reading is not a production of one's own psychic activity, as is something which one intends to write. In a large majority of cases, therefore, the misreading consists in a complete substitution. One substitutes another word for the word to be read, and there need be no connection in meaning between the text and the product of the misreading. In general, the slip is based upon a word resemblance. Lichtenberg's example of reading Agamemnon for Angenomen is the best of this group. 
If one wishes to discover the interfering tendency which causes the misreading, one may completely ignore the misread text and can begin the analytic investigation with the two questions. What is the first idea that occurs in free association to the product of the misreading? And in what situation did the misreading occur? Now and then, a knowledge of the latter suffices by itself to explain misreading. Take, for example, the individual who, distressed by certain needs, wanders about in a strange city and reads the word close thous on a large sign on the first floor of a house. He has just time to be surprised at the fact that the sign has been nailed so high up when he discovers that accurately observed, the sign reads corset house. In other cases, the misreadings which are independent of the text require a penetrating analysis which cannot be accomplished without practice and confidence in the psychoanalytic technique. But generally it is not a matter of much difficulty to obtain the elucidation of a misreading. The substituted word, as in the example Agamemnon, betrays without more ado the thought sequence from which the interference results. In war times, for instance, it is very common for one to read into everything which contains a similar word structure, the names of the cities, generals and military expressions which are constantly buzzing around us. In this way, whatever interests and preoccupies one puts itself in the place of that which is foreign, or uninteresting. The after effects of thoughts blur the new perceptions. There are other types of misreadings in which the text itself arouses the disturbing tendency by means of which it is then most often changed into its opposite. One reads something which is undesired. Analysis then convinces one that an intensive wish to reject what has been read should be made responsible for the alteration. In the first mentioned and more frequent cases of misreading, two factors are neglected to which we gave an important role in the mechanism of errors. The conflict of two tendencies and the suppression of one which then identifies itself by producing the error not that anything like the opposite occurs in misreading but the importunity of the idea content which leads to misreading is nevertheless much more conspicuous than the suppression to which the latter may previously have been subjected just these two factors are most tangibly apparent in the various situations of errors of forgetfulness forgetting plans is actually uniform in meaning its interpretation is, as we have heard, not denied even by the layman. The tendency interfering with the plan is always an antithetical intention, an unwillingness concerning which we need only discover why it does not come to expression in a different and less disguised manner. But the existence of this unwillingness is not to be doubted. Sometimes it is possible even to guess something of the motives which make it necessary for this unwillingness to disguise itself, and it always achieves its purpose by the error resulting from the concealment, while its rejection would be certain were it to present itself as open contradiction. If an important change in the psychic situation occurs between the formulation of the plan and its execution, in consequence of which the execution of the plan does not come into question, then the fact that the plan was forgotten is no longer in the class of errors. One is no longer surprised at it, and one understands that it would have been superfluous to have remembered the plan. It was then permanently or temporarily effaced. Forgetting a plan can be called an error only when we have no reason to believe there was such an interruption. The cases of forgetting plans are in general so uniform and transparent that they do not interest us in our investigation. There are two points, however, from which we can learn something new. We have said that forgetting, that is, the non-execution of a plan, points to an antipathy toward it. This certainly holds, 
but according to the results of our investigations the antipathy may be of two sorts direct and indirect what is meant by the latter can best be explained by one or two examples if a patron forgets to say a good word for his protege to a third person it may be because the patron is not really very much interested in the protege therefore has no great inclination to comment him it is at any rate in this sense that the protege will construe his patron's forgetfulness but the matter may be more complicated the patron's antipathy to the execution of the plan may originate in another quarter and fasten upon quite a different point. It need not have anything to do with the protégé, but may be directed toward the third person to whom the good word was to have been said. Thus you see what doubts here confront the practical application of our interpretation the protege despite a correct interpretation of the forgetfulness stands in danger of becoming too suspicious and of doing his patron a grave injustice or if an individual forgets a rendezvous which he has made and which he had resolved to keep the most frequent basis will certainly be the direct aversion to encountering this person but analysis might here supply the information that the interfering intention was not directed against that person but against the place in which they were to have met and which was avoided because of a painful memory associated with it or if one forgets to mail a letter the counter intention may be directed against the content of that letter yet this does not in any way exclude the possibility that the letter is harmless in itself and only subject to the counter intention because something about it reminds the writer of another letter written previously which in fact did afford a basis for the antipathy one can say in such a case that the antipathy has here transferred itself from that former letter where it was justified to the present one in which it really has no meaning thus you see that one must always exercise restraint and caution in the application of interpretations even though the interpretations are justified that which is psychologically equivalent may nevertheless in practice be very ambiguous Phenomena such as these will seem very unusual to you. Perhaps you are inclined to assume that the indirect antipathy is enough to characterize the incident as pathological. Yet I can assure you that it also occurs in a normal and healthy setting. I am in no way willing to admit the unreliability of our analytic interpretation. After all, the above-discussed ambiguity of plan-forgetting exists only so long as we have not attempted an analysis of the case and are interpreting it only on the basis of our general suppositions. When we analyse the person in question, we discover with sufficient certainty in each case whether or not it is a direct antipathy or what its origin is otherwise a second point is the following when we find in a large majority of cases that the forgetting of a plan goes back to an antipathy we gain courage to extend this solution to another series of cases in which the analysed person does not confirm but denies the antipathy which we inferred take as an example the exceedingly frequent incidents of forgetting to return books which one has borrowed or forgetting to pay one's bills or debts we will be so bold as to accuse the individual in question of intending to keep the books and not to pay the debts while he will deny such an intention but will not be in a position to give us any other explanation of his conduct thereupon we insist that he has the intention only he knows nothing about it all we need for our inference is to have the intention betray itself through the effect of the forgetfulness the subject may then repeat that he had merely forgotten it you now recognize the situation as one in which we once before found ourselves if we wish to be consistent in our interpretation an interpretation which has been proved as manifold as it is justified we will be unavoidably forced to the conclusion that there are tendencies in a human being which can become effective without his being conscious of them
By doing so, however, we place ourselves in opposition to all the views which prevail in daily life and in psychology. Forgetting proper names and foreign names as well as foreign words can be traced in the same manner to a counter-intention which aims either directly or indirectly at the name in question. I have already given you an example of such direct antipathy. The indirect causation, however, is particularly frequent and generally necessitates careful analysis for its determination. Thus, for example, in war times which force us to sacrifice so many of our former inclinations, the ability to recall proper names also suffers severely in consequence of the most peculiar connections. A short time ago it happened that I could not reproduce the name of that harmless Moravian city of Bicentz, and analysis showed that no direct dislike was to blame but rather the sound resemblance to the name of the Byzenzi Palace in Orieto, in which I used to wish I might live. As a motive for the antagonism to remembering the name, we here encounter for the first time a principle which will later disclose to us its whole tremendous significance in the causation of neurotic symptoms that is the aversion on the part of the memory to remembering anything which is connected with unpleasant experience and which would revive this unpleasantness by reproduction this intention of avoiding unpleasantness in recollections of other psychic acts the psychic flight from unpleasantness we may recognize as the ultimate effective motive not only for the forgetting of names but also for many other errors such as omissions of action etc forgetting names does however seem to be especially facilitated psycho physiologically and therefore also occurs in cases in which the interference of an unpleasantness motive cannot be established if any one once has a tendency to forget names you can establish by analytical investigation that he does not only lose names because he himself does not like them or because they remind him of something he does not like but also because the same name in his mind belongs to another chain of associations with which he has more intimate relations the name is anchored here as it were and denied to the other associations activated at the moment if you will recall the tricks of mnemonic techniques you will ascertain with some surprise that one forgets names in consequence of the same associations which one otherwise purposely forms in order to save them from being forgotten the most conspicuous example of this is afforded by proper names of persons which conceivably enough must have very different psychic values for different people for example take a first name such as theodore to one of you it will mean nothing special to another it means the name of his father brother friend or his own name analytic experience will then show you that the first person is not in danger of forgetting that a certain stranger bears this name while the latter will be constantly inclined to withhold from the stranger this name which seems reserved for intimate relationships let us now assume that this associative inhibition can come into contact with the operation of the unpleasantness principle and in addition with an indirect mechanism and you will be in a position to form a correct picture of the complexity of causation of this temporary name forgetting an adequate analysis that does justice to the facts however will completely disclose these complications Forgetting impressions and experiences shows the working of the tendency to keep unpleasantness from recollection much more clearly and conclusively than does the forgetting of names. It does not, of course, belong in its entirety to the category of errors, but only in so far as it seems to us conspicuous and unjustified, measured by the measuring stick of our accustomed conception. Thus, for example, where the forgetfulness strikes fresh or important impressions, or impressions whose loss tears a hole in the otherwise well-remembered sequence. 
why and how it is in general that we forget particularly why and how we forget experiences which have surely left the deepest impressions such as the incidents of our first years of childhood is quite a different problem in which the defence against unpleasant associations plays a certain role but is far from explaining everything that unpleasant impressions are easily forgotten is an indubitable fact various psychologists have observed it and the great darwin was so struck by it that he made the golden rule for himself of writing down with particular care observations which seemed unfavourable to his theory since he had convinced himself that they were just the ones which would not stick in his memory those who hear for the first time of this principle of defence against unpleasant recollections by means of forgetting seldom fail to raise the objection that they on the contrary have had the experience that just the painful is hard to forget inasmuch as it always comes back to mind to torture the person against his will as for example the recollection of an insult or humiliation this fact is also correct but the objection is not valid it is important that one begin be times to reckon with the fact that the psychic life is the arena of the struggles and exercises of antagonistic tendencies or to express it in non-dynamic terminology that it consists of contradictions and paired antagonisms information concerning one specific tendency is of no avail for the exclusion of its opposite there is room for both of them it depends only on how the opposites react upon each other what effects will proceed from the one and what from the other losing and mislaying objects is of a special interest to us because of the ambiguity and the multiplicity of tendencies in whose services the errors may act the common element in all cases is this that one wished to lose something the reason and purposes thereof vary one loses an object when it has become damaged, when one intends to replace it with a better one, when one has ceased to like it, when it came from a person whose relations to one have become strained, or when it was obtained under circumstances of which one no longer wishes to think of. The same purpose may be served by letting the object fall, be damaged or broken. In the life of society, it is said to have been found that unwelcome and illegitimate children are much more often frail than those born in wedlock. To reach this result, we do not need the coarse technique of the so-called angel-maker. A certain remissness in the care of the child is said to suffice amply. In the preservation of objects, the case might easily be the same as with the child. But things may be singled out for loss without their having forfeited any of their value, namely, when there exists the intention to sacrifice something to fate in order to ward off some other dreaded loss. Such exercisings of fate are, according to the findings of analysis, still very frequent among us. Therefore, the loss of things is often a voluntary sacrifice. In the same way, losing may serve the purposes of obstinacy or self-punishment. In short, the more distant motivation of the tendency to get rid of a thing oneself by means of losing it is not overlooked. Mistakes, like other errors, are often used to fulfil wishes which one ought to deny oneself. The purpose is thus masked as fortunate accident. For instance, one of our friends once took the train to make a call in the suburbs, despite the clearest antipathy to so doing, and then, in changing cars, made the mistake of getting into the train which took him back to the city. Or, if on a trip one absolutely wants to make a longer stay at a halfway station, one is apt to overlook or miss certain connections, so that he is forced to make the desired interruption to the trip. Or as once happened to a patient of mine whom i had forbidden to call up his fiancee on the telephone by mistake and absent-mindedly he asked for a wrong number when he wanted to telephone to me so that he was suddenly connected with the lady a pretty example and one of practical significance in making a direct mistake is the observation of an engineer at a preliminary hearing in a damage suit 
Some time ago I worked with several colleagues in the laboratory of a high school on a series of complicated elasticity experiments, a piece of work which we had undertaken voluntarily, but which began to take more time than we had expected. One day as I went into the laboratory with my colleague F., the latter remarked how unpleasant it was to him to lose so much time that day, since he had so much to do at home. I could not help agreeing with him, and remarked half-jokingly, alluding to an incident of the previous week, Let's hope that the machine gives out again so that we can stop work and go home early. In the division of labour it happened that F was given the regulation of the valve of the press, that is to say he was, by means of a cautious opening of the valve, to let the liquid pressure from the accumulator flow slowly into the cylinder of the hydraulic press. The man who was directing the job stood by the manometer pressure gauge, and when the right pressure had been reached, called out in a loud voice, Stop! At this command, F seized the valve and turned with all his might to the left. All valves, without exception, closed to the right. Thereby, the whole pressure of the accumulator suddenly became effective in the press, a strain for which the connecting pipes are not designed, so that a connecting pipe immediately burst. Quite a harmless defect, but one which nevertheless forced us to drop work for the day and go home. It is characteristic, by the way, that some time afterward when we were discussing this occurrence, my friend F. had no recollection whatever of my remark, which I could recall with certainty. From this point you may reach the conjecture that it is not harmless accident which makes the hands of your domestics such dangerous enemies to your household property. But you can also raise the question whether it is always an accident when one damages himself and exposes his own person to danger. There are interests the value of which you will presently be able to test by means of the analysis of observations. Ladies and gentlemen, this is far from being all that might be said about errors. There is indeed much left to investigate and to discuss. But I am satisfied if, from our investigations to date, your previous views are somewhat shaken, and if you have acquired a certain degree of liberality in the acceptance of new ones. For the rest, I must content myself with leaving you face to face with an unclear condition of affairs. We cannot prove all our axioms by the study of errors, and indeed are by no means solely dependent on this material. The great value of errors for our purpose lies in the fact that they are very frequent phenomena that can easily be observed on oneself and the occurrence of which do not require a pathological condition. I should like to mention just one more of your unanswered questions before concluding. If, as we have seen in many examples, people come so close to understanding errors and so often act as though they penetrated their meaning, how is it possible that they can so generally consider them accidental, senseless and meaningless, and can so energetically oppose their psychoanalytic elucidation? You are right. That is conspicuous and demands an explanation. I shall not give this explanation to you, however, but shall guide you slowly to the connecting links from which the explanation will force itself upon you without any aid from me. End of section 4